We read the word of the Lord in Matthew's gospel, the, the eighth chapter, beginning with the 23rd verse, we read this. And when he was entered into a ship, his disciples followed him. Behold, there rose a great tempest in the sea, insomuch that the ship was covered with the waves, but he was asleep. And his disciples came to him and woke him, saying, Lord, save us, we perish. And he said unto them, Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? Then he arose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. But the man marveled, saying, What manner of man is this, that even the winds and the seas obey him? Let us bow our heads now for prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we are so happy tonight to know that this great one who makes the winds and the sea to obey him is with us. We are grateful that we have this great witness of his living yet today. And knowing that he's eternal and he can never die, he's alive forevermore. And has showed forth his great mercy to us, the children of man, in these days. We are a needy people, Lord, so needy that no one else could meet our needs but you. So we're looking for you tonight to come into our uh, gathering here and to make yourself known to us by forgiving our sins. Increasing our faith, Lord, and healing our sickness and afflictions. And when we go to our homes tonight, may we be happy, saying like those from Emmaus, did not our hearts burn within us as he talked to us along the way? For we ask it in his name. Amen. You may be seated. I'm almost like Zacchaeus. These things are always too short for me. I want to speak to you just for a few moments now before we uh, pray for the sick. <clears throat> Thanking you for your fine cooperation and believing in spirit last night while we were speaking. Trusting that it will be a great outpouring of his blessings. Always remember what we're here for is to try to increase your faith in his presence that you might receive that which you ask for. Then by faith you believe. Now remember, every redemptive blessing has already been purchased. The price is paid. There's only one way that you'll ever be able to receive it, and it's to believe it and to accept it. He's the high priest of our confession. Uh, the Hebrew says there, the Hebrew letter says he's the high priest of our confession profession to profess and confess is the same thing of course so we he's a high priest of our confession therefore he cannot do anything to, for us until first we confess that he has done it and then when we confess it then he is a high priest a mediator to go to work on that and make it right yeah. so we pray trusting in God tonight in his kindness and mercy that he will Give to us his abundance of grace tonight. And now remember, you must accept it. Now we're going to pray for the sick before we leave, laying hands upon them. But I wish that you could have faith enough you don't have to have that. Yeah. I wish you could just reach up and say, Lord Jesus, I believe you. I, I, he believes the word. I see God is different from we are. If, uh, if we would say something... Uh, for you to do and you didn't believe it, well, we'd say, let them alone. They don't have to believe it. But that's not God, our Father. He, he constantly will do something else to make you believe. He's trying to keep his word and he will keep his word. Now, the reason he's doing the things that he's doing now is because that he promised to do them. Not that he has to do it, but he promised to do it. And that's our confidence that he always keeps his promise. Now, each one of you, when he have sick loved ones and so forth, set. If they came, like the little girl here, uh, she's too young and she's in that condition she is, just when you believe, lay your hands upon the child while the service is going on. Others that has loved ones, in your heart you're thinking of them. By faith, lift them right up before God. 
in prayer. Now, and therefore, then believe. When something happens, you, you can't make yourself believe. You, it's something, it's a quality that's in you. Faith is a substance, not just a ma- imaginary. It is a substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things that you believe and you don't see. And all the whole Christian armor, now remember, is by faith. All supernatural. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, meekness, patience. That's all unseen things. That's the whole Christian armor. The Christian always looks at things that he does not see because he's looking at a promise. Here some time ago, many years, I was called on a scene one time in a hospital to pray for a boy that was dying with black diphtheria. I've quoted this many times because it's a very outstanding case to me. The father was rather an aged man, a mother, and this young man was about 14 years old, I guess, and he was their only child, and he was dying with black diphtheria. And something happened to his heart. He's unconscious. And they were just, just all, just, just barely living. I forget what his, his heartbeat was. Respiration was very low. And the old father kept visiting the meeting, begging, seeing the manager and everybody, come pray, come pray. That's all. Just come to the hospital and pray. The manager said, bring him to the meeting. said, we can't move him to the hospital. He's dying. And said, if Brother Bram just come, ask God. God will grant it. Well, I thought, what a faith. I went to the hospital and the doctors wouldn't let me in. They said, no, you're a married man. You have children. Billy Paul was small then. Said, you cannot go in. Said, because you have a child. And I said, now, I've understood that the doctor himself was Catholic. And I said, if the priest wanted to give the last rites to the child if he's Catholic, would you permit him to go in? Said, that's different. The priest has no children. See? Said, you'd pack the germ to your child. And I said, but look, sir, let me take the responsibility. I'll sign a paper. I'll take the responsibility. If I've got faith enough to go in there, then uh, for that, I have no business going in the first place. I said then, but I'll take the responsibility. And I said, think of it now. If that boy was Catholic and he was dying, and would you by any means keep the priest from giving the last rites to church? He said, oh, I wouldn't do that. I said, I mean just as much to them as a priest does to a Catholic. And he said, all right. And he finally agreed. He dressed me up like a Ku Klux Klan of some sort, all this kind of stuff over me, and tucked me in there to this little boy, dying. The mother and father knelt on the other side. And I prayed just a simple little prayer, Lord Jesus, I trust you to raise up this boy on the basis of the faith of this father and mother, and laid my hands up on the little fella. He'd been unconscious for three, about three days, I believe, and just merely breathing. And I got up, said amen, prayed about a moment, and got up, and the old father tucked the mother in his arms and said, think of it, honey. Our boys healed. No sign of it at all. And they were just hugging each other and thanking the Lord. And the little nurse, little child, young lady, rather, she's probably about 18, 20 years old. She had her nurse's band and she, her, she was a graduate nurse. And she said, Sir, I'm afraid you don't understand. She said, The boy is dying. He said, Oh, no. The boys go to live. The father did. And said, how can you act like that? And you're, you know your boy's dying under such a false impression as you've been given. So that's no false impression. She said, look, now I might, there might be a doctor sitting present. I don't know this about medicine, instruments, uh, medical terms. They give him a, some sort of a cardiogram. And his heart was so low. It had been low that long. The doctor said... The nurse repeated, the doctor said, he, that's never been known in history. If a heart ever get that low, for it to ever revive again. I'll never forget the old man's look. Old fatherly-like fellow walked up and put his hand up on the little nurse's shoulder. He said, sister, he said, see, you're looking at that chart. He said, that's all you know is to look at that. He said, I'm looking at a divine promise. The boy's a missionary in Africa now. Got three children. It depends on what you're looking at. He believed. 
Now that's the same faith. If you'll come lay your hands upon my child, if you'll speak the word, my servant, see, that's something that you have. You, it, it, was, it wasn't putting on an act. The old fellow believed that. He got a hold of something. The woman that touched his garment, if I must just touch his garment, that's it. You must grasp a hold of that faith down in your heart. Amen. It's just like you say, you know, you man, if you're, if you're the right kind of a husband, there's no woman in the world that you love like your wife. There might be other women, might be more fair. There might be women that would, uh, uh, would be uh, 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 prettier women and so forth. But something, if you really love your wife, there's something in there that you don't notice what she looks like. You love her, and you, you don't know why, but you love her. And women, you the same to your husband. You, you love, and you young girls to your boyfriends, boyfriends to girlfriends. If you've met that person that you know you love, there's something in there you know you love them. That's the same thing it is about faith. You know it's going to happen. There's yes. not a shadow, no matter how many would say contrary, you still believe the same thing. Because that's genuine, real genuine faith. Now I have that tonight while we speak on this subject. I um, spoke so much and been meeting so long now I haven't had a let up hardly since Christmas and a little horse in my throat from changing weather and time and so forth. I um, want to speak to you tonight on the subject of awake Jesus or calling Jesus on the scene. From our scripture reading we find that there had been a great meeting. Jesus had been going about doing great wonders, always doing good, and also doing what was pleasing to God. He always pleased God, but he didn't please himself, the Bible said. And we find out that he was thoroughly made himself known who he was by his works. His works identified who he was. And Virtue had gone from him. He had been teaching parables all day. And virtue had gone out of him. And he had, uh, was going to cross the sea, across over on the other side by being what he was. He, he knew there was a great job ahead on the other side. And he was very tired. Virtue had gone out of him all day long as the people had touched him by their faith to believe him and so forth. And he had, the virtue had left him and he was... Tired, so he went back in the back of the ship and laid down on a pillow, the scripture tells us, to take a little rest while the ship was crossing the sea, crossing the Sea of Galilee. An opportunity for a little rest. His disciples picked up their oars and hoisted the sails, and just as seamen would do, they that's what their money of them, their occupation. They were fishermen there on the sea, and, and they know. Uh, how to control these boats. And this back at their occupation, just uh, having a great time of rejoicing, a jubilee time, perhaps talking about the things that had happened that day. You know, there's something about it that when we see our Lord Jesus do things and can know that it's Him, that nothing else could do it but Him, we just simply... When we get together, we just, everybody wants to testify. Everybody wants to say something. And they want to talk about it. You can have a revival at your church. The pastor can speak a marvelous message. Or the evangelist or whoever it might be. Or you can see some certain thing take place or something in the neighborhood. Someone was healed. The neighbors get together and talk about it. How marvelous was you there? You should have seen it. It was the most outstanding thing Something about the works of God that thrills man's heart more than anything else that happens. Amen. It's just an unforgettable experiences when we come in contact with the Lord Jesus and see the things that he does. So great and marvelous is his ways. Now, we find out that they were rejoicing over the works that had been done in that day's revival. And perhaps I would liken us tonight in the same manner. Now, we have just witnessed one of the greatest revivals I believe that the world has ever seen in these last 10, 15 years. It's been an, a revival not just like the days of Billy Sunday or the days of the Welsh revival 
or the days of, of Wesleyan revival or the Moody revival or Billy Sunday revival. It's been a worldwide sweeping affair around the world. Great healing services and great revival fires has burnt on practically every hill there is in the world. Right tonight, way over in the lands of Africa, down in China, Japan, this gospel is being preached and people are being healed right this very minute, around and around the world. It's been one of the greatest revivals because I believe it's one of the last revivals this world has seen. A world sweeping revival. But now, in the last few years, it's quietened down. You don't notice the enthusiasm in the people that used to be. I remember having the privilege by the Holy Spirit to spearhead that revival. It started when that angel of the Lord appeared on the river and said that about many years ago. And to see it happen and see it set ministers' hearts afire everywhere, revivals broke out. Why, you could just simply walk into a building and the people just get up out of their cots and stretchers and walk away healed. You didn't even have to say one word, just, just being there, that's all it taken. I remember one night in Vandalia, Illinois, walked into the meeting and no more had been in the meeting over five minutes, and there wasn't a feeble person around the place anywhere. Wheelchairs pushed out and piled up, blind with seeing, deaf and dumb speaking, and, and it just simply, it, the Spirit of the Lord was present and it just healed a whole group of them. Now, that's when you can do something, when revival is going. But let that revival fire die down. Then you can hardly, the people are still Christians, but they're not revived into that spirit, that great atmosphere that does something. It's just like in a forge, in a blacksmith shop. You've got to get the iron hot before you go to pounding it on the anvil. If you don't, you'll never straighten it out. That's what it takes to have a revival is everybody under the heat of the Holy Spirit that's brought down the powers of God in a revival moving. Then there's prayer meetings going day and night, every minute, everywhere, while the people wouldn't even leave the grounds. I remember in Jonesboro, Arkansas, when I first started my, about my third meeting, first in St. Louis, and then at Carning, then down to Jonesboro, the paper stated 28,000 people in the meeting. For 20 or 30 miles from the city was just tents set up. You couldn't get a farmhouse to stay in, the little city of Jonesboro. And people coming for miles, packing lanterns, walking through the jungles, catch a, a bus and come. I sat out in the wilderness one evening praying before the service started, and I seen young ladies coming with their shoes and stockings under their arm. Then before they get down there, stop and brush off the dust from their feet, put on their stockings and and, and shoes and, and go into the meeting. And I've seen them lay their sick children under old cotton trucks and stay there day and night. Praise Whole papers and canvas over them while it was raining, storm of blowing, not leave their place, waiting just to get inside the building. There's where the blind was seeing, the deaf was hearing, and the ministry tonight is a hundred miles beyond that. But the revival fires has died down. See, the people walk up there and say, just point your finger and say, well, do you believe, brother? That's all. He's out and gone. <laughs> That's all it had to be done. They believe the revival is a moving. Now, these disciples had seen that. And in an amateur form, they were living the joy while Jesus was resting of what they'd seen done that day. And I think the revival is doing something like that. That we're now just... Living in a quietening time while he's resting, uh, maybe uh, between the meetings or the revival and his coming. And we are rejoicing over the things that we have seen done during the time of this revival. Great, wonderful works. No matter what the world says, we've still seen it done. It's a statement. It's a fact. It was done. They must have took an opportunity while... The sales was going along pretty well to talk about him, about his acts, about his claims, about his messiahship. Many of them, might, uh, uh, of these disciples, might have spoke of what they had seen done one to another. 
just like we do, during the time of the revival at uh, Shreveport, during the time of the revival at, at some other town, we talk about it. Now, that's the way they were doing. Maybe it was Simon, as we talked about last night, saying, well, when Andrew told me about him, I was just a little bit skeptic. But when he told me who I was and who my father was, that took all the guests out of me. I, I believed it then. It might have been if Philip might have said some of the other way. It might have been Andrew said, we talked about the lady at the well last night. Might have been talking about her when they said something like this. Brethren, you know, when my strange time was, when I, we went away to get some vittles and we come back, and we're standing outside the bushes and seen him talking to this ill-famed woman, we thought in our hearts, what if uh, some of the priests would come up and see this, our master talking to a woman of this caliber? What would they say about him? And then we remember how we knew that had confidence in him that it was for some purpose that he was talking to her. And then when he told her, go get your husband and come here, and she said, I have no husband. How our hearts jumped because we thought, there's one time there's a failure. Jesus had told the woman that she had, go get her husband when she had no husband. You remember the look that we had on each other's face as we marveled to think that all the confidence we had in and here it was dropped all of a sudden. Then we find immediately he spoke up and said, you've told the truth. For you've had five husbands and the one you have now is not yours. Mm -hmm. Then when she recognized him then as the Messiah, the Messiah of God, and said there that we know that Messiah's coming, you must be a prophet for we know when the Messiah cometh, he's going to do this. And the testimony in that city, that woman's testimony had bearing on the people of the city. Praise. Then it might have been young John that said, you know, i tell you what made it real to me. That day when he broke the bread. Now we was all hungry and he had went out into the wilderness and we couldn't find him. And there we met him and all the multitudes came around. And the first thing you know... We find him saying, send him away to the city to get some food. And, and he told us to feed a man. And he got those five biscuits and two little fish. And he broke that bread. And I noticed his hand. When he would reach back for another piece of bread, that biscuit would grow down again. And then when he reached back, put it out in a plate and reached back, that fish has grown out again. Not only the regular fish, but it was a cooked fish. Already grow back again. What kind of an atom did he turn loose, brethren? Cook fish, cook bread, bypass the growing. We know he's the creator, but here he's making creation of already cooked fish and cooked bread. John might have said something like this. He said, you know, when I was a little boy, we lived down by Jericho. I remember my Jewish mother used to rock me to sleep in the afternoon, take my afternoon nap. I used to look up in her eyes and she'd tell me Bible stories. And you know that's a good thing for any mother to do to her child. Bring up a child the way it should go. It'd be better to turn her on the television and watch uh, some of these here things that goes on on the television. It'd be better off if you read him a Bible story. Because it's impressing his little mind. Now, said he, she used to tell me about the... A story of the Shunammite woman receiving her little boy back to life by the prophet Elijah. I like that. And then she used to tell me about our people coming up out of Egypt. And we was right on the Jordan River. And she'd point across the river and say, John, they camped just on the other side. And they were 40 years in that wilderness. And God fed them manna. Their clothes never wore out, and God gave them bread fresh every morning. And how my little childish heart, I used to say, Mama, has God got a lot of big ovens up there in the skies? And he bakes all this bread and gets his angels ready, and they bring down the morning bread and lay it out on the... No, I should say, John, you're too young to understand. God doesn't have ovens in the sky. He don't need ovens. We have to have ovens. But... God doesn't need it because He's a creator. 
See, he just speaks. Amen. And the bread laid out on the... He is the creator. And brethren, when I stood there today and watched him take that piece of bread and tear it off, and when he reached back for another piece, it was created. I know we wasn't following, following a false prophet. That was the creator himself in man. And uh, then they might have discussed the attitude of some of the people. Some believed, some did not. And then his attitude towards the people. Now, you know, Christianity has changed so much in these last days. Now you've got to baby a person, promise them a whole lot, give them a whole lot, uh, uh, to make them believe, come to church, I have promise them that they'll have uh, better associates and everything. That's not Christianity. Amen. Christianity is not babied. Christianity is rugged. Amen. Right? It's a, it's a, a Christianity is not a hotbed plant. A hotbed plant is a hybrid plant, mostly. You have to spray it all the time, keep the bugs off of it. That's because of its weakness. And that's what you have to do in a lot of Christians, kind of spray them with a, a lot of promises. Right. Amen. You, you don't need it. A real, genuine, healthy plant don't need any spraying. The bugs stay off of it. Yes. It's just like today, that man trying to take things and pervert them. God, in the beginning... He said, let every seed bring forth of its kind. I was reading in Reader's Digest here where they, they're taking what we call a hybrid corn. And it makes a prettier ear, sure. Great big fine ear, but it is no good. Nothing to it. And they make a better tomato. They don't even taste like a tomato. They make got a chicken now that don't even have wings. <laughs> Hybriding. See, it? now remember, you might have hybrid corn. But you can't plant that seed back. It won't produce again. Right. It'll die. Amen. Why? It don't have no life in it. You have to hybrid it each time. If it wouldn't, it just keep on multiplying. That shows that evolution, according to man's ideas, is wrong. You can take a, a mare horse and a jack and breed them together and get a mule. But a mule cannot breed itself back again. It's Amen. finished. That's all. He's finished. And they say now that in another 20 years, if they don't keep these people meeting this hybrid stuff, like of uh, corn and wheat and stuff that they're hybriding, that is changing the, the posture of women. They won't be able to have babies in 20 years from now. It's killing the generation that hasn't got the stuff in it. Man's not made like they used to be. Look at man today. Why there used to be ball games is rough. Now they have to wear helmets to kill a dozen every year, hitting him on the head like a guinea. He dies right now. Mm. Fights and everything. Man's made up out of a bunch of muck. It's, it, it's because of hybrid stuff. It has polluted the whole system of, of our living, our whole economy. It, and, and that hybriding's got into the church, too. Instead of having a real rugged bunch of Bible believers, they've hybrid it by denominations. Amen. And they have to, I got this, I got that. And I belong to this and I belong to that. It's hybrid. And the thing can't produce itself again. We need a book of Acts again. But the only way you'll do it is get back to the Bible and away from some of this hybrid religion. Hybrid. It had to be babied. No faith. Just a bunch of, of powder puffs. Just uh, sissified. Babied into it. I'm, I say, you're a Christian. I'm Methodist. Are you Christian? I'm Presbyterian. I'm Pentecostal. That don't mean that to God. You're a Christian because you're born in the Spirit of Christ. And the Word of God lives in you. You know, uh, I always enjoy a hybrid horse. You know, he's got sense. You can, you can teach him things. Do things for him. And he'll learn. But you take an old mule, you can't do nothing to him. He's just a big old long-eared donkey. He sits there and you can talk to him. He'll stick his ears out and honk, honk, honk. See, that, he's just a hybrid. But to my love, these so-called Christians hybrid donkey religion. You tell them Jesus Christ the same yesterday and forever. They say, ah, don't believe it. See, so you can't never teach him nothing. He's gone anyhow. My church believes it this way. My believes it that way. But God's Word says he's the same yesterday and forever. 
I like not a hybrid Christian. I like a, like a pedigreed horse. He knows who his papa was, who his mama was, who his grandpa and grandma was. He knows all the generations all the way back. Yes. So does a pedigreed Christian. Yeah. He knows who his father is. He come from God. He's the word of God. He's the same as he ever yeah. was. He's a real pedigreed product of God. Yeah. The word of God is in him. Jesus Christ manifesting himself. Yeah. Bunch of unbelievers. Jesus wanted to shake off a bunch of parasites one day. He had too many following him. He had his disciples. Then he had the 70, the ministerial association. Then he had the congregation by the thousands. And then he made this statement. He said, except you eat the, blood, eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Amen. Now, what do you think a medical doctor would say setting out in the congregation? What do you think a sensible thinking man would? What we call sensible thinking. He never explained it. He didn't have to explain it. While the doctor said, get away from that fellow, he's crazy. He will be human vampires. Drinking the blood of a man, eating his flesh. And the congregation, I imagine the priest said, this is the time. Here's where we come in. Out we go. We'll never attend another one of the meetings. Away they went. Then he got all them away from him. Then he turned around and he said to the 70, he said, what will you say when you see the Son of Man ascending up into heaven from whence he come? Now them 70 said the Son of Man ascending up from whence he come. Why, well, he had us at the very manger where he was born. We know his mother. We seen the clothes, the swaddling cloth he was wrapped in. He was born down there in Bethlehem of Judea. He was brought up over here in Nazareth. There's his brothers, his sisters, and all of them with us. And then he said, this Son of Man ascended up. Now, he didn't explain it. That's right. He just said it. Amen. Amen. Now, they couldn't explain it. They couldn't fix it out in their mind. Well, they said, here's where we come in. So they went out. That's as much as they could stand. They still have the same groups. Yes. That's right. We still have them. We notice. Then he turned. Remember, those disciples couldn't explain that either. But they had faith. Yes. Then Jesus turned and looked to the twelve and said, Will you go also? Then Peter made those notable words. Lord, where would we go? For we are fully persuaded. We know that you have the word of life. Amen. And we all know. Think. They couldn't explain how he's going to eat his flesh and drink his blood. They couldn't understand how he's going to send up where he uh, come down from when he was born in Bethlehem. They could, but see, faith don't know no failure. It's anchored. It stays there. No matter what anything says. It stayed there. They were ordained to this life. And he's, they stayed there. Now, those different kinds. Some believed. Some said a man never spoke like this. Some didn't believe. And they said, oh, that might have disgusted that. Some said a man never spoke like this man. There's something strange about him. What he says, he's able to back up. Well, they did say that, you know. said he don't talk like a priest. He doesn't talk like a rabbi. For what he says, God backs it up. He vindicates what he said. Oh, my. It must have been young John then said, think of it. We have him with us right now. What a comfort that must be. What a security. What a security it ought to be to us. Yes. Amen. I'm a missionary. Round and around the world. And I've seen all kinds of religions and all kinds of gods that they have, the heathen gods. The Mohammed, the Buddha, and Sikh, Jain, or whatever more. And the heathen gods, the tribesmen. But every one of them, there's none of them right but Christianity. Every one of them, their founders are dead and they got the grave where he was buried. But Christianity is the only one's right because our founder died, buried, but rose again. Amen. And we can prove that he's alive. Amen. At the grave of Mohammed for the past 2,000 years nearly, been a white horse, changed guards every so many hours, waiting for Mohammed to rise up the dead and ride down the world and conquer it. But Jesus is already up from the dead. Been up for 2,000 years. And it's with us tonight. Yes. And then when we see the darkness and see the end of time, the way it is now, coming up to the hours that we're living, while we're sailing life solemn main, where the stormy seas and, and the vessel can wreck at any time, these little lights can snap out like that. Yes. Or we might never leave this building tonight. None of us. We don't know what time deaths are coming. And what a secure feeling it must have been 
to those disciples to know that the very Creator that had thoroughly identified Himself to be that person was sailing with them. And what a blessed thought it is. What a blessed hope it is. What an assurance it is. And this dark hour at the end of the world's history to know the Creator is sailing like Solomon with us. Safely tucked in. Bombs, whatever may come, let them ride, burst, blow, whatever they want to. It makes no difference to me. I'm sailing with the Creator. What a security while sailing these waters. Now, while speaking, talking of Him about what great things He'd done, at the revival feasting, Jesus was probably resting like He is, I said, between the revivals. And we, they had been so clearly identified to who He was. The people knew who He was. Of those who were blinded, but those who had a hold on the Scripture... Because they know that the Scripture, God's Word, has been given a lot to each generation. And that promise of that age has to be fulfilled. And He fulfilled exactly what was supposed to be done in the time of the Messiah. He met every qualification. Then we, He was assured that He was the man. But you see, He was so common... He didn't dress like a priest. Amen. He had no, not an education as, as what we'd call education. We had no record of him even going to school. But there was something about him that was different. And then he invited them when they couldn't understand. He said, search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life. And that's the thing that testifies of me. They tell you who I am. And I remember that all had this in their heart and was thinking of these things. And while sailing around on the sea, how they could be like children as long as he was in the ship with them. Now, friend, what that ought to do to us, the same identified Jesus Christ, the same creator, the same God is with us tonight. What a sick Cure it, it is. What a feeling to know that His presence is here. Yes. Now, we find right when this having this great time, all of a sudden trouble arose. The ship rocked, the sails blew off, the water filled the boat. All hopes of survival was gone. Now, isn't it strange? Just like it is now as we're coming down to the end now. Isn't it strange? We can talk about how great He is. We can tell how great He is in our church when we testify. We tell the, our, our employees, employers how great He is. We tell the people on the street how great it is. And when trouble strikes, we are frustrated. We just... You know, the things that we've seen Him do. The things that we know He does. And just let a little sickness or a little trouble strike the home. Watch what happens. All gone to pieces. All, all hopes is gone. Though they had seen him do so many things, all forgotten when trouble strikes. Like now, we have seen this great revival. We have history of other great revivals. We have his presence. We know these things. And sometimes trouble sets in that we can't remedy. uh, For instance, like now, we have trouble in our churches now. We have denominational troubles, arguments in our churches. We don't know what's going to take place. We see a great thing farming up there. All of us believers in the Bible see something's fixing to take place. There's nobody but what knows that. And all the churches are going to be brought into that ecumenical council of churches. Yeah. And when you do that, you're going to forfeit your great evangelical teaching of the Bible. Amen. And the Pentecostals are sympathizing with it, going right into it like a hog right. going to its slaughter. Right. That's right. Ecumenical council, many great Pentecostal leaders agreeing with them. I'm telling you, don't you never stick your neck in a thing like that. Amen. That's exactly what the Bible said would come to pass. There's the beast in the market perfectly. Everything's set right in order. And we see this and we wonder what's going to be the outcome of it. Trouble set in. And they forgot that the very one that they were talking about, the very creator was in the boat with them. 
Now you say, if I could think that, well, remember, we still have him because he's the word always. And John 1, 1, as we spoke last night, he was the word and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we still have his word that directs us to his thoughts and his doings for this day. See, the, not the thoughts Moses had in his day, not the thoughts of disciples, not the thoughts of Luther or Wesley or the Pentecostal age or any of those. We have the Bible here that tells us of what's going to happen now. Amen. See? We see the Pentecostal revival in the Bible, the Lutheran and all those church ages. We saw them. But we also have the scripture here tell us what it's going to be now. And that's God. God interpreting his own word for this age that we're living in. He's his own interpreter. And yet we get frustrated. Don't be frustrated. His disciples sometimes get in physical troubles that they can't remedy. Such as sickness, cancer, so forth that the doctors can't, don't know what to do about it. We like them forget who's in the ship. They should have known that he knew all these things. He knew they were going to happen. He, was a, he knew all things, so he knew this was going to happen. In order to happen to him, what was it let it happen? When he got in that ship, he knew that was going to happen. He knows that we had to meet this condition, and he's foretold us here in the Bible it be that way. Now, what was he doing? Testing their faith. Why would he let a, a, a fine little mother-looking woman sit in a wheelchair like that? Why would he let a fine young fellow share these young men sitting here in these wheelchairs and ladies and so forth? Why would he? And still, they might be crippled this, live an ordinary life. But there may be some sitting here with heart trouble. If God don't heal you, you may be dead before morning. That's right. He knew it was going to happen. Maybe it's done to give our faith a test. That's what it was done for them. He said so. See? Same now. He had proven who he was. By the words and signs that he had proved among them that he was the vindicated, anointed Messiah that was to come. And he's proved among us by the baptism of the Holy Ghost and the return of the things that he promised in this day that he would do. He's proved that he's here. He proves that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Then see how easy we can get frustrated in any little thing? We should never let it happen. No. He said, if I do not the works that's written to me, then don't believe me. And if the church, if the Holy Spirit today isn't doing the things that it was supposed to do for this hour, then don't believe the message. Amen. You've got a right to disbelieve it. But he promised that these things that he's doing right now would be taking place right at this Amen. time. Amen. So it ought to make us feel so secure. So I'm going up to the meeting. The great Holy Spirit, I understand, is up there. Revealing the secrets of the hearts of the people. That's exactly what he said he would do. Amen. When he'd be revealed in the last days, Jesus Christ said himself that that's exactly what he would do. And he said the world would be in a condition like it was in the days of Sodom. That's just where it's at now. Amen. He said the churches would be separated just like they was then. Lot, the lukewarm, down in Babylon, or down in Sodom, and the Sodomites. He said Abraham, the elected, called out group. And he sent a messenger to the elected group, and he sent two messengers down to them, representing each one. That's just what he's done. Even to every name, every action, every move, everything just perfectly, every sign, every manifestation, just exactly the same. He said it would happen. Now, what are we scared about? What's these things on us for? He's trying to see what we'll do about it. Notice. He told him, said, now, if you can't believe me, believe the works that I do. They testify who I am. They should have known it, but they didn't. He was God who created the creator of the winds and the sea. If he could create the winds and the sea, could he not more make them obey his word? If he created everything, can he make everything obey? Let us remember also he created our bodies. They also will have to obey His Word. Amen. Well, you say, if I could just be sure of that. Well, we are sure of it. He's sure to prove it so. They have to obey it. Remember, He's got, when we are laying nothing but maybe a spoonful of ashes, He promised to raise up that ashes. He promised to raise it up. The body has to obey Him. 
And that's when we die, we rest assured that we'll be raised up because he promised he'd do it. And his promise is his word. Amen. And we believe, you believe in a resurrection of the body? Amen. Sure, if you're not, you're not a Christian. So we believe that he'll raise us up at the last days. He promised to do it. And what is that? That's his word. That's where we stake everything that we got right on that word. And then when it comes to the time that we see the word being identified to be with us, then we're like the disciples in another case when they're out on the sea and, and they're about to sink again at another occasion. And they seen Jesus come walking on the water. And they got scared. They said, it's, it's a spook. It's scary. Afraid it was a spirit. And they cried out with fear. The only thing that could help them, they was scared of it. Yeah. And so is it today. Amen. The very only thing that can help people, they're afraid of it. Amen. He said, fear not, it's I. He speaks. How would you know it was him? He's identified by his word. That's why he's identified the first time. That's why he's identified every time. By his word. Notice. After these disciples found themselves at the end, it must have dawned on some of them that the Creator was still with them. I hope it does that to us tonight. For Hebrews 13, 8 says he's the same. Then what did they do? They awakened Jesus. Go wake a Jesus. Wake him. Call him on the scene. He's very easy call. They had seen, uh, seen so many things that God had done and, and, and the words of vindicating him. So have we. And he was not hard to be called into action. They woke him up and said, Do you care if I not that we perish? You say, How can we be sure of this? Can we prove it? John 14, 12, Jesus said, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. That's exactly our faith bringing Christ in our presence. He said in, in Luke 17, chapter, in the last days when the Son of Man is being revealed, it'll be a time like Sodom and Gomorrah. We see that happening. He said before that time taking place in Malachi 4, that there'd be a message go forth that would restore the people back to the original faith that was once delivered to the people. Yes. Always God's program to do that. And then the wicked would be ashes and the righteous would walk out upon their feet. We see all these promises. He's waiting right now for you, 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 every one of you, to call him on the scene. Yes. Call him on the scene. That's Amen. where he wants to be. Hallelujah. Called on the scene of action. Notice, when you call him on the scene, so then we say, let us wake him. Then call him to confirm his word and to... The thing that he promised to do, the way he had, we would know in the revelation of Jesus Christ in the last days would be like it was in the days of Sodom. He promised that revelation to the church when he would be revealed. So don't doubt, fear. He's the same yesterday and forever. Yes. I heard a woman one time when I was talking about him being so great. She said, there's one thing I have against your teaching, Mr. Branham. I said... Well, thank you. If you only have one thing, I said, I hope God only finds it that way. And she said, well, you brag too much on Jesus. I said, I hope that's the only thing that's against me. And I said, I don't brag enough on him. She said, oh, yes, you do. She said, you make him divine. Is a woman that didn't believe that Jesus was divine. She's Christian science. And said, um, uh, you, make him, uh, you make him divine. Make him God. I said, he's either God or the greatest deceiver the world ever knew. I said, he said, well, I can prove to you by your Bible that he wasn't, he was just merely a prophet. I said, he was a prophet, truly, but he was God also. Said he was a man and he was mortal. I said, that's true also. She said, on the road down to raise Lazarus from the grave, uh, St. John the 11th chapter, said the Bible said Jesus wept. I said, that's true. She said, well, that proves that he couldn't be divine and weeping. I said, oh, my lady, is that your argument? I said, that's a weak one. She said, I said, true. He was a man when he was weeping. But when he put it, his little body in motion, pulled his little shoulders back and said, Lazarus, come forth. Yeah. And a man that had been dead four days and was rotten in the grave, stood on his feet and lived again, that was more than a man. Yeah. Yeah. That was God. He was a man out here in this boat that night. 
when he's out on the sea where 10,000 devils of the sea swore they'd drown him. That little old boat tossed about like a bottle stopper out there on the Sarmy Sea. He was a man, tired, sleeping. But when they awakened him and called him on the scene, yeah. he put one foot up on the braille and looked up and said, Peace be still, and the winds and the waves obeyed him. That was more than a man. Yeah. That was God. Hallelujah. He was a man. When he come down off the mountain, hungry, looking on a tree to find something to eat, he was a man when he was hungry, but when he'd taken five biscuits and two fish and fed 5,000, that was more than a man. That was God in that man. Every person that's ever mounted to a hill of beans has been people who believe that. Right. Poets and what more. Believe that. That God was in Christ reconciling himself to the world. And now Christ is in the church reconciling the people to God. He promised to do it. It has been written that he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Do you believe that? Amen. I believe it with all my heart. It is just waiting now to be called on the scene. Oh. Now, the only thing can call him on the scene is for us to awaken him in ourselves. Amen. Call him on the scene. Yes. He was the greatest gift that God ever gave the world. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Whosoever believed in him not perish have eternal life. Watch God in His gift. Now, the people use God's gift. A little woman one time, she believed that He was the manifestation of God in flesh. And she said, if I touch His garment, I, I, I'll be made whole. Now, she touched His garment, and He turned around and said, who touched me? See, virtue, strength has gone from me. She touched His garment. That was her using God's gift. See, He got weak from that. But when he went away from the home of Lazarus, remember, St. John 5, 19, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself, but what he sees the Father doing. Amen. Remember, Jesus Christ never performed one miracle, never did anything in the way of the supernatural until first he saw a vision on what to do. Yes. How many believe that to be the truth? St. John, barely, not what I hear, not what somebody tells me. What I see the Father doing, that doeth the Son likewise. Now, if that isn't so, then the rest of Scripture isn't so. Barely, barely, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing in himself. But what he sees the Father doing, that doeth the Son. The Father worketh, and I worketh the other two. In other words, he just acted out, done what God told him to do. Now, remember... When he went away from the home of Lazarus, he's gone several days, Lazarus got sick and they sent for him. He didn't go. A few days later, Lazarus got sicker, so they sent for him again. He still didn't go. Then when the appropriate time the father had showed him what happened, Lazarus died. And he turned when Lazarus died and said, Lazarus dead. And I'm glad for your sake I wasn't there. They'd be wanting to pray for him and so forth. He just done what God told him to do, what he saw a vision. See, he had seen a vision on what to do. But I go wake him. Mm. There you are. Praise the Lord. Watch Martha coming to see him. She said, Lord, if thou would have been here, my brother would not have died. But even now, whatever you ask God, God will give it to you. Amen. See, he knew what he was going to do. Watch him at the grave of Lazarus. He said, Father, I thank thee thou hast heard me already, but I just said it for these who stand by. Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus raised from the dead. Now, he never said a thing about getting weak there. That was God using his gift. Yes. And the people using God's gift was different. Or he was the Word. And the Word is sharper than a two-edged sword, says the Bible, and discerns the thoughts and intents of the heart. Yes. Amen. That proves that God is in the midst of the people. Amen. Yes. Amen. Let us believe it. Amen. He's ready, according to his Word, to be called on the scene tonight. How many of you are sick and needy? Raise up your hands. Let's see your hands. How many is sick and needy? Anywhere. Well, the only thing he's waiting for is to be called on the scene. Just ask him. Now, what if he was standing here with this suit that he gave me? And you come up in front of him and said, Lord Jesus, I want you to heal me. You know what he'd say? I've already done it. He was wounded for our transgressions. With his stripes, we were healed. He can't do it the second time. So see, he's already done it. You have to believe it. Amen. 
There's nothing you can do meritorial to anything to, to earn your salvation or healing. There's nothing you can do about it. It's a free gift of God. See, it's grace, a free gift. If I give you a million dollars and you straighten up my tie, I didn't give it to you. You've done something for it. See, God's gift is free. The only thing you have to do is believe it, that he has purchased this for you. you it's already purchased. He did it for you. And there's not a man in the world. I don't know what you've had here in Baton Rouge. Everything's drifting the country. Impersonations, and that, we know that's just got to be that way. But when a man comes in and tells you he has power to heal you, he's lying. God alone can heal. I'm the Lord thy God who heals all thy diseases. He'll not share his glory with anybody. There's no man has power to heal. But there's man who has gifts. To manifest God, your pastor, <coughs> pardon me, he can take God by a gift of, of a teacher. He can explain the word so you're bound to see it. If you've got any eyes to see with, you'll see it. There's another, maybe some other gift. But there's always a gift that manifests the presence of God. And through there, you yourself have to believe it. A sinner might come here at the altar as a young man or woman at the age of 14 years old. And they bring you your meals here, and you cry to the Lord until you were 90 years old. You'd never be saved. But the, you've got to first accept what He'd done for you. Amen. See? You've got to accept it yourself. Then, when you accept it, then He is the high priest, mediator, to make intercessions upon your confession of what you believe. Now, that's the same thing by a gift this way. It's getting your own mind away from you. And then, see what he says do. I see people come to the platform, they jump up and down and scream and say, Oh, Brother Branham, I got all faith in the world. <laughs> what are you doing up here then? Yeah. That's, that's emotion, not faith. Genuine wine, faith knows no defeat. It's already done. It's already over. God said so, and that finishes it, you see. God said so. Yeah. Now, it's the same thing anytime. When you really believe it, that touches him. Yeah. Now, that little woman that touched his garment, she said, if I but just only touch his garment, I'll be made whole. And she did it. And when she carried out what her faith wanted her to do, touched it, he felt it. Mm -hmm. See? And he turned around He spoke to her. Now, he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. If you will just only believe Christ, believe him, let your faith touch his garment, and he right now is a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. We all know that. Amen. And if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he'll have to act today as he did yesterday yes. if he's the same high priest. Yes. Now, won't you believe it? It's to have faith in God. Amen. If I've told you a lie, then God won't back it up. If I've told you the truth, you're, you're back, he's obligated to back the truth up. Jesus said, I, I have a witness. And the witness is God's word, of course. That the, the scriptures testify of me. If they don't testify of me, then they don't believe it. See? And if the scriptures doesn't testify of what I'm telling you now, that he's the same yesterday and forever, then don't believe the scripture. Because the scripture said he was. And he promised these things for this last age Remember, just at the end of the Jewish age, that's how he revealed himself, Messiah. The end of the, the age of the Samaritans, he did the same. Now it's the end of the Gentile age. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Awaken him in your conscience. Call him on the scene while we bow our heads. Amen. Heavenly Father, just a word from you now will be sufficient. It'll be all that we need. Just a word from you. May the people clearly understand what the achievement, what we're trying to do, Lord, is to, is to let them get the benefits of the Lord Jesus that they love and serve. May they do it tonight, Lord, because your death was not in vain. You were wounded for our transgressions, bruised for our iniquity. The chastisement of our peace is up on And with the stripes, we were healed. I pray, God, that everyone in here in divine presence will understand this and will get the vision and will be healed for the glory of God. Through Jesus Christ's name, I present 
myself with this congregation to His honor and glory. Amen. I'll be real reverent just for a few minutes. Now, just a word from Him would mean more than all I could say or all anyone else could say because it's Him doing it. He is the one. He's the doer. And we are trusting that the the Lord Jesus will grant these things to you. Now, each one. Now, let's see what time. I didn't know what was that. <clears throat> I tell you, to get out your own time, what we're supposed to, we haven't the time to bring up this line. Let's call it right in the audience. Now, let's just take the scripture just a minute. Now, the Bible promises in this day that the repeat of Sodom and Gomorrah will be repeated. How many believe that? Now raise up your hand. The Bible identifies that. Now, and then, what was that at Sodom and Gomorrah? It was God in the form of human being. And the way that Abraham noted it is when he said, why did Sarah laugh in the tent behind her? Why did she doubt it? The words that he had spoke to be so. He could perceive what Sarah was thinking behind him. Now, you just see if that wasn't... Now, that wasn't to the church of Babylon, or the church of Sodom. No, no. That wasn't to them people down there in the denominational ranks. No, Sarah. Never goes to them. They got their messenger. But to the elected church, the super seed of Abraham, that's supposed to believe the word regardless of what circumstances is. Abraham called those things which were not as though they were. God said so, and he believed it. Now... Friend, I, I know that God's obligated to this word to keep it. Now, I want you, wherever you are in the building, to sit reverent for a few moments, wherever you are, and believe. Just believe with all your heart. Now, if I could heal you, if I could heal this little girl that my heart goes out for, if I could heal that little thing laying there, ha, I, I'd, I'd crawl from here to the North Pole if I could to do it. Uh, anybody's got any human feeling, but I could no more do that than nothing. Maybe some of you won't live a little bit with a cancer. If I could heal you, I'd be, I wouldn't be fit to stand on this platform if I could do it and wouldn't do it. I, I could, my heart goes for you. I'd do it if I could, but I can't. There's no other man can do it. That's right. But you see, Jesus has already done it. And he's only trying to get you to believe that. But you, I feel sorry for the people who have been so many things that just blinded them this way and that way to poor people like sheep without a shepherd, hardly. They don't know what to do. One says this and one says that. Don't think what man has said. Days of miracles is past. There's no such thing as baptism of the Holy Ghost. And remember, Peter said on the day of Pentecost, the promise is unto you and to your children and to them as far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Right. Jesus promised these things would happen in the last days. That God would return in a form of human flesh, like you and I, here tonight. Amen. And would work that same thing just before the world would be destroyed. And the world would be like a Sodom. Okay. Now, we got the Sodom condition right. Every position, every person, everything sitting just exactly right. Now, can our faith come to that? Can't we call him on the scene? Call him on the scene. Your faith is the only thing that can do it. Amen. Now, you believe with all your heart, each one of you now. And I want to ask you something. Without any prayer cards, out anybody up here, if that great Holy Spirit will come down here and by the anointing of you and the anointing on me and will identify that Jesus Christ is working in among us like this, what more could he do? There's not another promise in the Bible above that. That's a supreme promise. How many knows that? Sure it is. It's the it's a last thing to the church age. The Jews in time of the tribulation period, and only there they have a, a visit back there, but uh, not to the Gentile church. This is the last thing promised to the Gentile. It's true. See, as the Gentiles down there, Sodom is going to be burned. And that, here's the, the bride, which was the royal seat of Abraham, being the bride called out from amongst the Gentiles. That's their ending sign. It's all of it. Mark it in your book. I'm an old man. But just mark it in your book and see if it comes to pass or not. See? You're at the end now. When, I don't know. I'm looking for him today. If he isn't here today, I'll be looking for him tomorrow. If he isn't there tomorrow, I'll be looking the next day. If he isn't here this year, I'll be looking next year for him. I know he's coming. I don't know the minute or hour, 
But I know everything's fulfilled, ready for the rapture. The church is called out. It'll be a secret going, just vanish, and that'll be all. The world will go right on just the same. People preaching and people thinking they're getting saved, just exactly like they did in the days of Noah, so forth. Noah entered the ark, and people went right on. The world turning just the same. Think of it. And eternally lost, thinking they're saved. Some of these days, I'm going to bring a big tent in this country and pitch it up here so we can have afternoon services and instructions so we can understand these things better. Get all our brethren together so we can have services. Now, if Jesus Christ fulfills his promise, then we are obligated to believe him. I want you all, each one of you, just to have this simple, childlike faith to believe him. As you just kind of start with your heads bowed and start praying, saying, Lord Jesus, now I know that this man doesn't know me. And I'm needy. And we're told that you're a high priest that can be touched by the feeling of our infirmities. If you'll just let him, if I can touch you, speak through him, Lord. And I'll, I know his, I know it's you. I know he doesn't know me. And that's out there in the audience, just a mixed up audience of belief, unbelief, make belief, sinner, saint, all together. Now you must believe. Now, if he will do this from this audience here, I want each one of you in here say, Brother Branham, I, I know that that's, has to be him. It's looking up on the congregation as he did then. I want you, if you really will believe, I want you to raise your hand and say, Lord, I'll accept it with all my heart that I believe it's Christ Jesus according to his promise. All over the building. God bless you. That's fine. Oh, it's just too bad we haven't got a month to be around here. See, just let, I'm new to you. See, it's hard. You just keep believing. Ah, uh, it's a light. Uh, God is light. We know that. Pillar of fire. And now you just pray and touch it. And may the Lord Jesus answer. Now, I take every spirit in here under my control in the name of Jesus Christ for his glory. I be real reverent. Pray. Be real reverent. Now, here it is. There's a lady right here in front of me. She's got her head down and she's praying for her own affliction. If you want to raise your head now. She's right here in front of me. Do you believe with all your heart? Do you believe that God can heal that diabetes and make you well? Mm-hmm. Now that's what you have, diabetes. I do not know you. You're a total stranger to me. But do you believe me to be his servant? If, if we are strangers, one another, raise up your hand like this so that people see Here's the lady. And now she's suffering with a diabetic condition. And do you believe that God can tell me who you are? Would it make you believe? You're Mrs. Martin. That's right. Raise your hand. You just have faith. Don't doubt. Have faith. Now, what did she touch? I want to ask the audience. What did she touch? There's a woman with her right hand up in mine too, before God. She touched something. Just a simple little woman. It actually, to tell you the truth, I used to say this is her. It surprised her. She didn't know she had that much faith. Faith is not something you manufacture. It's something you have. She's surprised. Even right now, the woman feels different than what she did a few minutes ago. She knows something has happened to her. Here. Don't you see that light right here? Sit right over this woman right here. Right back here. She's suffering with a... She's got her head down. She's praying. But she's suffering with trouble with her back. If she'll believe with all of her heart, she can be healed of that back trouble. I'm sure she's going to miss it as certain as anything. See, her prayer's still moving on. Lord, help me. Mrs. DeVille... It's you. <laughs> That's grace. <laughs> the woman was praying, wasn't even thinking, wasn't even hear me say nothing. Now you ask her if she knows me. That's who she is and that's what her trouble. 
As far as she touch. That's the vindication of Jesus Christ. The word discerns the thoughts that's in the heart. You believe? Just have faith. Pray. Anywhere. Just believe. That's all you have to do. Just believe. Just believe I told you the truth. Now, I'm not he. I'm just his servant. Just his servant. If you just have faith enough, I can't call him. I know what he's trouble, but it, <clears throat> just wait a while. Maybe it'll change. Certainly not impossible. But you got to move out of that bracket. He can't believe for himself. You've got to believe for him. A lady suffering with kidney trouble. She isn't from here. She's from Mississippi. <laughs> She believed with all of her heart God will heal the kidney trouble. Mrs. Palmer, if you believe with all your heart, you can be healed of it. It's left you. Turn light over. It's gone from her. Have faith in God. Don't down. There's a lady sitting right next to her. She's suffering with arthritis. Do you believe me to be God's prophet, lady? You do? You believe a God to tell me who you are? Will that help you to believe? Your name is Mrs. Meadow. You believe with all your heart now. You can be healed too. That caught fire to a lady next to her. She's sitting there also. They're going right down the line. A lady sitting there. She's suffering with, next to her, suffering with a diabetes. A sugar diabetes. They want her to go to the hospital, but she refuses to do it. She's got a son she's praying for also. That son isn't here, but do you believe God can tell me what's wrong with that son? He's got heart trouble. You believe and he'll heal you. Do you believe God can tell me who you are? Mrs. Duffel. D-U-F-F-L-E. That's right. Is that right? Raise up your hand. With your hands open. All right. Now you believe and you can be made well too. Praise the Lord. Do you believe that that's the same thing that uh, you believe that Jesus Christ's presence is here now? Amen. How many accepts that? Oh, what a security. What a security. See, what did you do? You awakened him. You brought him on the scene. Here he is on the scene. I don't make any what the boats are saying. Remember, he can say, peace be still. Do you believe it with all your heart? If you do, stand up on your feet and accept it. Stand up and say, I believe it with all my heart. Raise right up to your feet. I now believe it. That's right. No matter what's your trouble, stand up. Give me praise. Heavenly Father, we bring to you this audience. They're conscious that you're here, Lord. May ever devil unbelief, may it leave its hold and may Jesus Christ heal the audience. Satan, come out of this audience. In the name of Jesus Christ. You are resentful.